Genesis chapter 1, and most of us know the story of the account of creation, how that day 1 he created certain things and day 2 and so forth. But we pick up with day 6, verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them, and God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Now the King James talks about replenishing. But I want you to listen to what it actually, the actual Hebrew word means fill the earth. Fill up the earth. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea. Rule over the birds of the sky. Rule over every living thing that moves on the earth. Then God said, behold, I've given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of all the earth and every tree which has fruit yielding seed, it shall be food for you. And of course, you can read on down and you can see some of the rest of what God said. But I want you to notice what God did. God gave man an assignment and then he gave him two pieces of equipment, if you will, or two things we can identify or define as endowments that were enabled from God that enabled man to fulfill this assignment. This assignment was to dominate his environment. So we see right there from the very start, God never intended the world to overcome man. He intended man to overcome the world. Let's just settle the issue that divine healing is in the original command. He had dominion over creeps, everything that creeps. Have you ever seen any type of a live bacteria under a microscope? You have dominion over everything that creeps. Glory to God. Have us dominion over every virus, dominion over every bacteria. So it's there. In the original command, divine health is in there. And so you see that. Then he said, subdue it. Subdue it, have dominion. But what I want to latch on to is this idea of fill. The Hebrew word, actually, you can stretch it out to mean fulfill. In other words, fulfill what I tell you to do, fill up everything. So God's original plan through Adam was for him to take the garden and enlarge it. The garden was a spot on the earth that God created for Adam to show him how he wanted him to live. Then he gave the whole world to Adam and said, take the seed that's in this garden, plant it wherever you want to, and make the whole world a garden. Glory to God. Fill it up. God's original plan was a plan of fullness. When God spoke this to Adam, everything God said to him and everything he told him to do was new. When God originally created man, he created him expecting that all of his conversation with man would be about man's future. Man didn't have a past. It was not God's will for man to ever make a decision that would mandate God to have to communicate with him about anything other than his future. So consequently, when he gave him dominion, he's talking to him about his future. When he gave him seed, he's talking to this man about his future. He's saying every seed will reproduce after its own kind. Your seed is a part of your dominion. Your seed is a manifestation of your dominion. Use your seed to create what future you want? The thing is, God began to deal with me about something by the Spirit of the Lord that I saw was a major thing the enemy uses, but he tied it back to the experience I had in October when he visited me and basically said to me out of Isaiah 43, 18 and 19, consider not the former things, neither the things of old, for behold, I do a new thing. Even now does it spring forth, I will make rivers in the desert, a way in the wilderness. And then he says, shall you not know it? In verse 19, shall you not know it? But he's telling us that anything that has a past cannot be correctly called new. He's saying to us, I'm going to do a new thing. And he said, the only way that this new thing can manifest 
is this new thing has no relation to some past thing. And if you insist on attaching a past thing to the new thing, the new thing will never come to pass. See, your future is supposed to be decided by new things. God wants to talk to you about the new thing he wants to do in your life. God wants to talk to you about your future. But the problem is, so many people are stuck in conversation with God about their past. And the reason they are is because of the same thing happened to them that happened to Adam. Adam disobeyed the command, and you know the story. Eve took of the fruit she shouldn't eat. Adam was right there with her, made the decision to, uh, to go with his wife. And without really embellishing that or belaboring the point, from the time they sinned and were excommunicated from the garden until Jesus came, every bit of interaction with God except for promises and prophecies was interaction with man about his past. That's why the Old Testament's called old. And the reason man could never get over into what God had originally intended was because he had an attachment to the past. He had mortgaged his future. He had an attachment to the past he could not get free from. Now, when you see this, one of the things that we need to learn about what God wants to do in our lives, and I want you to turn over with me, if you would, to the book of Romans. Romans chapter 7 and we're going to be, begin reading in verse 6. Now I'm reading from the New American Standard because I love the way that it reads. But now we have been released from the law. Aren't you glad you're released from the law? We have been released from the law, having died to what by which we were bound. So that we serve in newness of the spirit, not in oldness of the letter. Now, you're going to serve God one of two ways. You're either going to serve God in newness or serve Him in oldness. And if you are bound to a sin consciousness, you are doomed never to get into what He promises because what He's promised is your future. And the only way to get over into the promise is to die to the old. You either serve God in the newness of the Spirit or the oldness of the letter. And so God is wanting to talk to us about this newness, this new future we have, this new life. That's what God was saying to every human being when he said in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. In Ephesians 2, it says God took Jew and Gentile, brought them together, took everything out of their way that was contrary to them, and in Christ he made peace, destroying our enemies and the hostility, and created one new man. Now this is why the Bible says, put on the new man. Just like I was talking about Moses of old, if you don't make a decision to come to the place to where you refuse to allow the old man to dominate the new man. And this is what happened with Moses. He finally came to a place that if I'm ever going to see the power of God, if I'm ever going to break into what God has for me, then I can't just be a Hebrew on the inside and an Egyptian on the outside. I have got to be a covenant person through and through. I have got to wear my heritage. I've got to wear my covenant. I've got to eat my covenant. I've got to live my covenant. So that it comes on the outside as well. And that's exactly where we are, most of us, in our heart, we know that we have authority to dominate this situation. But in our head, we come to church, sing about the glory, yak about the power. How you doing, brother? Oh, I'm blessed. I'm blessed. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I'm blessed. Learn the language. Make sure we don't have a negative confession. You know why? Because we've gotten a hold of this process. And what we don't understand is that we've done just exactly what Jesus said you can't do, which is nobody gets a new garment, and if it has a tear in it, you don't sew an old piece of cloth on it. And basically what we've done is in the way that we think about the Word of God, in the way that we approach our walk with God, we're basically like taking a baby, 
who has soiled its diaper and taken a bunch of talcum powder and stuff, you know, and whatever else we can find, spritz a little uh, cologne on there, open them up, you know, dump it down in there, and then take a new fresh diaper, put it over the old one. Well, I'm just going to tell you, here's what's going to happen. It may last for a little bit, but it's a Band-Aid because the thing that was causing the stink in the first place is still there, and it's eventually going to bleed through. And that is exactly what's happened in most Christians' walk. When, when you're talking about dealing with your future and these, and these sorts of things that the Spirit of God is saying to us, then what we do often and why we have no power is we will take a new, a new thing God wants to do. But what we really are doing is we think the New Testament is a patched up Old Testament. Now, here's the thing. It can't be new if it has any old in it. Meaning every requirement of the old had to be met. That's why you have to be righteous. Because the old covenant called for you to be righteous. And there's only one way you can usher in a new covenant is fulfill the old one. Otherwise, it can't be a new covenant. But you are right with God. Amen? Amen? You are right with God. And so God then wants us to talk, to begin to develop an understanding that his entire communication with us, he wants us to mature. You know when Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, he said, when I was a child, I thought like a child, I spoke like a child, I understood like a child, but when I became a man, what did he say? Put away what? Well, he's not talking about putting away your weevils that wobble and don't fall down. He's not talking about, about putting away, you know, your battery-powered fire engine. What's he talking about putting away? Certain thoughts, certain ways you talk, your understanding. Evidently, when you mature, your understanding changes, which causes you to think differently. And when you see clearly and think differently, your speech manifests it. Your speech is the fruit of where you really are. That's why the Bible says, out of the bunch of the heart, the mouth speaks. That inward image is ultimately going to come out of you, and you're going to tell people where you really stand, how you really view yourself. And most people beat themselves up all the time. And you want to know why? Because they're forever trying to claw their way into the new by fixing the old. You cannot go into the new. By spending all your time trying to fix the old. Because in trying to fix the old, you're focusing on it. You're developing it. You're developing its thought life. You're developing talking about it. You're developing the image of it. You're developing an image that that's who you were. And so often you deal with what you are because what you are is a result of who you were. And so what you are is still attached to what you were. And what we have to do is get delivered. We can't just patch this thing up. We can't just throw a, sew a bunch of pieces of cloth together. We need some new coveralls. You can't take new wine and put it in old wine skins. The one thing I saw about Adam was this. God never intended to talk to man about his past. All communication that God intended to have with man was about his destiny and his future. Man's own decisions and shortcomings demanded God to have to deal with him on a lesser level, which is about his past. But God, now God is God. Something I want you to understand. Your sin did not change God. If you don't get anything else, you get that deep inside. God didn't change because man sinned. He didn't change his plan for man. He didn't change his will. God cannot lie. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so, when he said, God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful, multiply. God blessed them. God wanted man to be blessed. So when man sinned, did that change God? Did it change what God wanted? Did it change what God willed to do? No. And you know how you know that? Well, you know that already because you know God can't lie and God can't change. But let me tell you the best way you know how that. Follow the track of how he deals with man. When he finally encountered Noah, what's the first thing he did to him? Made a new covenant with him and blessed him and said, be fruitful, multiply. As long as the earth remains, seed time and harvest. Did he not? And then when he got hold of Abraham, what did he say to him? 
I want to bless you. In blessing you, I'll bless you. I'll make you a blessing. I'll make your name great. Follow it. You cannot find anywhere where God interacted with man. He said the same thing to Moses. And through Moses, he said the same thing to Israel. He said, I'm going to make you a thousand times as many as you are. I'm going to rejoice over you to bless you. And in blessing you, I'll multiply you. Out of the hills, you'll dig brass. Suck oil out of the rock. Eat bread without scarceness. Live in goodly houses. Houses you didn't build. And you'll reap from vineyards you didn't plant. I want to bless you. I love you. So the point is, when you look at God almost all the time, you can almost not find a place in the Bible, even in the Old Testament, where when God is talking to His covenant people through one of His men, that He's not talking to them about their future. He's always talking to them about the promised land. I always talk to them about what, and see, but they're forced many times to deal with the past because it's the issue that's keeping them out of the future. When you study the Bible in the Old Testament, you'll find that the only reason God talks to men about their past is to reveal to them how that past has kept them from his good future. And every time somebody repents and comes back to God, he quits talking to them about the past. God's not really interested in talking to you about your past. Isn't that a good thing? I don't know what that's doing inside of you, but that excites me so much. This phrase kept coming up in me a few days ago, looking forward. He kept talking to me about looking forward. And one of the things he told me about ministry was that almost all ministries spend a significant amount of the energy he gave them to go forward Dealing with the past. The number one thing that just surfaced just immediately was debt. Now, if you just put raw numbers to it, and you only have X amount of income a month, and 30% of that income goes to a mortgage, then you don't have but 70% of your income to look to your future. Because a mortgage is simply this. Debt is simply this. A portion of what I'm doing today is spent paying for a decision I made yesterday. Does that make sense? So the truth is, debt service is really dealing with the past. And that's the deceit that Satan has sold on the body of Christ. Because we couldn't believe God for prosperity and couldn't believe God to stay debt free. He tricked us into the deceitfulness of riches. Into thinking we can borrow this money to build this building and that's progress. No. You may be in a new building, but you're servicing the past. You're not building the future because the truth is if you borrow the max of what you can borrow just to get the shell up or the building up or whatever, then basically until 30 years from now, you may have a new building, but you're not working on the future. Do you see where I'm going with this? And consequently, it has kept our lives... And the more we add, the more we patch it, and the more we add to it, and the more we deal with it, and the more we have to deal with it, then the larger percentage of our lives is spent dealing with things today that have an attachment to decisions we made yesterday and very little of the spiritual energy, the gifts of the Spirit. Our faith is going toward vision casting. We're not dreaming because we're not free to dream. I'm going to say it again. We are not dreaming because we're not free to dream. Now, I'm going to turn that thing around for you today. And I'm going to talk to you about living by faith. I'm telling you by the Spirit that there is nothing you're walking through right now that should keep you from dreaming. The seat of life is your inner man. And one of the things that activates your faith is a blueprint of the future. You've got to start talking about the future. You've got to begin to give yourself permission to dream again. Because if you don't, what's going to happen is you're going to be tethered to managing your past in present circumstances. See, a lot of people think they're progressing because they got all the bills paid this month. That doesn't mean you're going anywhere. If you're in debt, you're not even back to zero. You're not even at break-even point while you're still in debt. Amen. God... Wants to talk to you about your future. Can you see why it's so hard to hear from God? 
because you're spending all your time dealing with your past and he's trying to talk about your future and y'all don't speak the same language. We've been dealing with so much stuff, we lost our dream. Dream. Come on now, dream. Whoa, get yourself free. Dream. Now, when the Lord started talking to me about looking forward, and he was talking to me about this, there's a handful of things that he dealt with me about, and I just want you to follow me in them. Let's go to Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 1. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 1 says this, I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will watch to see what he will say to me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. Verse 2, And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision, make it plain upon tables that he may run that reads it. For the vision is for an appointed time. Well, now then we're talking about God communicating with us about our future. Are we not? So we're talking about putting ourselves in position to talk with God about our future. You know, we always preach this from the vision standpoint. In other words, we talk about the power of writing your vision down, the power, and I'm talking to you about that today, indeed, yes, but, but notice what he said. There's two sides to this, and verse 1 reveals it. Let's go back to verse 1. He says, I will stand upon my watch, I will set me upon the tower, will watch to see what he will say to me, and. Now, this is the side we don't talk about very much that we have to deal with. And what I will answer when I am reproved. See, whether the vision comes to pass or not isn't determined by God having a vision for you. Whether the vision comes to pass or not is determined by how you respond to it when it's revealed to you. And unless you get detached from your past, you'll find it real hard to talk to God about your future because you think your past is attached to it, and it's not at all. God often won't talk to you about your future until you can quit bringing up reasons why it won't work. So what somebody disagreed with you umpteen years ago? So what somebody said something about you and it hurt your little feelings? So who are they to dominate your future? What power do they have to tell you you can't do what God told you to do? But I'm going to tell you, as long as you don't forget it, as long as you don't get delivered from it, as long as you keep rehearsing it, as long as you keep carrying it around, you are empowering your enemy to dominate your future. You've got to quit carrying that stuff around. Hallelujah. And quit talking about it. You have to get absolutely free from it. You have to consider not the former things, neither the things of old. For behold, I do a new thing. God's wanted to do a new thing in your life. Well, then he's talking about the future. But what we're more talking about is our answer to the future. What is your response? The Holy Ghost just told me to tell you that's why grief is not of him. See, a person that's grieving is not looking to the future. A person that's grieving is laboring under the heavy depression caused by an event in the past. Amen? And that's why you want folks to be Christians when they die. Because when they die, they're like a seed. They leave your present, but they go into your future. And that's why for the believer, we may have some sorrow and loss of fellowship, but we don't sorrow as those that have no hope. The dead in Christ will rise first. The trump is going to sound. Jesus is going to descend in the air. And with a shout, we're going to be changed. We'll be caught up with him. Dear God, we're going to be at a banquet table for eternity. Why sit around here and mope for 20 or 30 years just because somebody went early? Let's get about getting our job done. I tell you, it doesn't do anything for those people for us to grieve. Grief is extremely selfish, and it tethers you to your past instead of releasing you into your future. Today, I pray by the Spirit of God that I can, by the help of the anointing, release you into your future. That's what we're believing God to do today, is release you into your future. Now, to do that, we need to talk about a few more things. What will keep us from going into our future? What will keep us from being able to realize it? Number one, lack of taking ownership of our future. Now, see, the body of Christ has long been laboring under this perpetrated lie that uh, we're waiting on God. Now, don't you think it would have been foolish after God spoke to Adam 
for him to sit around waiting on God to come back and tell him where to plant that seed? He gave him the whole earth and gave him the seed and gave him the dominion over everything that would keep him from fulfilling and carrying out the command. All Adam's got to do is say, oh, that looks like a good spot. And the seed's going to grow, and it's going to grow because he has dominion. He's in control. He's in control of his future. But the body of Christ, because of a lack of understanding of the authority of the believer, have thought we have been taking something away from God if we make decisions on our own. And yet he gave us the mind of Christ, empowered by the Holy Spirit, to know what to do, to have the wisdom, have access to the wisdom, to take ownership, to say, I believe I want corn in that field, I plant corn. I believe I want beans in that field, I plant beans. I believe I want a building over there, I build that building. See, until you realize that you are not blaspheming, let me say it this way, until you realize you are free, you have been freed by God to make decisions about your life. That is very important. Please don't get offended at me because if you have this in your yard, there's nothing wrong with it. It's just all personal preference. My favorite kind of fencing is not chain link. And I don't particularly feel like chain link fence matches a log house. And sometimes when you buy a home that someone else has built, they made decisions you wouldn't have made. Right? And we had a chain link fence on our log house. I lived with that fence there for years. Hating, I'm talking about hating that fence. Hating that fence every time I'd weed eat. It'd eat up the string. I just hated it. Grass grow up, you got I just despised it. And years into owning this home, one day it dawned on me. I own this house. I can take that fence up if I want to. I didn't have to sit around and ask God, can I take up the fence? And that's what people are doing with their future. They don't realize they've been given talents. They're supposed to buy, sell, and trade. They're supposed to take ownership of their future. And so consequently, we got that chain link fence gone. And doing some stuff now we've always wanted to do, and we're going to finish it up this year. I said we're going to finish it up this year because we're getting our seed ready. It's such a joy now, I'm just going to work on my seed. Everything I do, I'm working on my seed because that seed's my future. The reason I know about these, just ask me, ask me how I have intimate understanding of this. Well, because I've experienced it all. Because I was laboring under this mindset for a long time as a minister of the gospel, not taking ownership of what God wanted done. And I can remember, we bought that acreage on the interstate. He told me to buy it as from a ministry. Most of you know we had 16 acres on the interstate. But the Lord began to speak to me about that. And one day, I never will forget, it's about, oh, about three or four years ago, well, we had owned the acreage for four or five years. All the time accruing in value, God had a plan that I didn't fully understand, but I do now. But here's the thing. I probably could have put that acreage up for sale long before we did because I talked to God about it and he would never talk to me. I never saw anything we're supposed to build on it, how we're supposed to build, what we're supposed to do. Finally, one day I went to God and I said, God, the reason that I don't want to do anything with this piece of property is if you gave it to me to put a building on, I don't want to sell what you gave me. He said, son, I told you to do and he laid out some things, X, 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 X. Now, you decide. You want to build over there? Or you want to build out by the airport? What's going to be easier for you? So, well, Lord, I'd rather be by the airport. See, he started talking to me about this. He said, son, you own the land. He said, you're my child called to do something in the city. The land you bought, you own it. Will it help you do what I told you to do? Or could it be better served some other way to do what I told you to do? Then make the decision and do it. He said, as long as you do what I told you to do. I'll bless that decision. I got so free that he owned that land on the interstate because we owned it. He didn't own it till we owned it. Does that make sense to you at all? The day we got it is the day he got it. Religion has kept us out of our future because we've been waiting on God. See, I was waiting on God for years to talk to me about that interstate property. When the bottom line is, could have set this thing in motion long ago by taking ownership of the future. And the moment 
I got to talking to God about the future. He got to talking to me about the land. I couldn't hear anything as long as I was so worried about making a decision that it might offend God that I sell some property he gave me. I'm talking about taking ownership. Taking ownership of your future. Here's the checks and balance with that. How do you know then you're not going to just go off your own way? Well, here's how. I have made a covenant with God when I first got in the ministry, when I first started walking with him. Because I learned that when you pray and you're dealing with something and dealing with a decision, you can go as much by what God doesn't say as by what he does. I made a covenant with God long ago that I did not want to be deceived, that I wanted to fulfill his will, that every fiber of my being I wanted to not bring reproach on the gospel, and I gave him permission that at any time I was going to do something, he could interrupt me if it was a deadly thing or a negative thing or a dangerous thing to do or if it was a trap. Well, he's done that. That red flag comes up. That, mm, that no hits me. Okay. Okay. I realize now when I talk to God for a while about something, he doesn't say anything. He's basically saying it's your choice. And a lot of people don't ever do anything for 10 years because they're begging God to say something. It's because they won't take control. And you know why they don't take control? They're afraid to. Where's the fear come from? Fear from the past. We're getting free of that today. So basically, what are we saying? Set your house in order. Set your house in order. Number two, free yourself to dream. Now, what in the world am I talking about free yourself? Well, number one, he said for me to tell you, you can't dream if you're bound by current issues. In other words, if you are so anxious about what you're walking through, that fear is manifested by something that you've attached to it in the past. Well, I'm afraid if I do this, what if? See how the past taints your future? And so basically, if you're dealing with issues, anxiety, fear, now, you can have it if you want, but I'm breaking it off of me and my and my house. And that is the inability to make a decision is nothing more than a manifestation of fear. When you're like, I can't decide. I just don't know what to do. I just, I just don't want to do the wrong thing. That's fear. The inability to step into a decision is a manifestation of fear. And so consequently, it manifests then or develops in you a stronghold of procrastination. I keep putting it off. I don't want to face it. I can't make that decision. Because what if I say the wrong thing? What if I do the wrong thing? What if it doesn't turn out right? See, that's all attached to your past. And so basically he said, free yourself to dream. You can't dream if you're bound by current issues. Now there's three. There's an ABC under this. Number one, make an effort to lessen the amount of energy and time you are talking about how things are. Now, it's not going to happen overnight because you've trained yourself. You don't realize it, but you're always bringing up what happened to you in 1983 that caused you to think this way. Well, I tried that once, you know. I made an investment and I lost some money. So I'm never going to believe anybody could ever get any money out of stocks again. Well, no, your whole future's bound up. What most people don't realize is they've had, in America especially, they've had more than enough disposable income to be rich by now. And we just want to look in the mirror and admit it. But the truth is, had you put a little bit of money in the right place, you wouldn't be where you are right now. See, what I've decided is, there's always going to be opportunity. See, I latched on to the prophecy of Jesus that said, till he returns, they're going to be buying and selling and building and planting. It's going to be like it was in the days of Noah when they went into the ark. Everybody's talking about it's going to crash, and it's going to this, and it's going to that. Not according, I believe Jesus more than I believe CNN. Now, we may hit some dips and some down times, and there may be some struggles, and there could be inflation and, and issues with interest and all of that. But if you'll walk this thing out, I'm telling you, the richest men that ever lived in the last two centuries made all of their money at the worst economic times. Before this country went off the gold standard, when gold backed our currency, it doesn't anymore, it's all paper now. John Paul Getty had so much money during the great crash of 1929, 30, 31, and 32, when everybody else 
is absolutely jumping out of windows and eating in soup lines and everything else. If you study what the man did, he invested when blood was running in the street. And he came out so wealthy that when the U.S. government needed a loan, he, one man, bailed out the United States currency by loaning to the government. Don't tell me the economic climate is why you're in trouble. It's a lack of vision. See, the people that didn't invest in the tough time were the people that their whole energy, all their energy was spent making it through the day. That means they spent all the energy God gave them to change their circumstance just trying to cope with it. So we got to get out of this cycle. And here's what he said. Make an effort to lessen the amount of energy and time you're talking about how things are or what caused them to be how they are, which is your attachment to the past. See, what caused things to be as they are for you to say, well, this happened, it's why I'm like this. We have a fancy name for what is a word we don't want to use. Excuse. It's an excuse. If you can't pull your little darling self up by your bootstraps, and look to the future and say, my God's bigger than that. Then you have much future. But if you can embrace your future, then here's what will happen to you. You can spend all your energy dreaming. And boy, when you get over there, God will start talking to you about what to do today. See, there's two ways to look at today. Today, I can try to make through dealing with all that I have based on my yesterday decision. Or today, I can be dreaming about my future and God start talking to me about what I need to do today to make my future different. It's your choice. So he said this. Basically, get free from the excuses of what you're dealing with. Now, write this down. Your tongue will take you backward or forward. Number two. This is B, under freeing yourself to dream. This is the second thing. Decide to live an uncluttered life. Mark out beside that thing, in quotations, discipline. The little word nobody likes, which has at its root the word disciple. You want to be a disciple of the Lord? You're going to have to have some discipline. What that means basically is this. Procrastination. It'll clutter your life up. I'm not just talking about natural things. Now, natural things are important because, you know, if things are a mess, you don't even know if you got one. You know, well, I bought three of those, but I don't know where to get it, so i got to go buy another one for the job. And so the truth is somebody could break in and steal something from you. You wouldn't know it was gone. Unfinished business. Let's talk about this one a little bit. Unfinished business will clutter you up in a way nothing else will. I walked in to my desk that high. Because I'm gone. and all. Now, my excuse is, let's talk about excuses. My excuse is, well, I'm, not, I'm just not here enough to get that. Or, that's a lie. That's an absolute lie. Because I'm here enough to pick up a piece of paper and throw it in a trash can. And I guarantee you this. If something has sat on your counter for 90 days or more and you hadn't done something with it, you need to chunk it. You either need to deal with it or throw it away. And I'm going to tell you why. Because it'll talk to you. Every day you pass that counter, it'll say to you, do something with me, do something with me, do something with me. It's amazing how much freer you are when you just throw it in the trash. Do something with me. If you hadn't done something with it, get rid of it. You know why? It is the seed of condemnation. Basically, that is a stack of things you know you felt like somewhere in your brain or in your heart you're supposed to do and you didn't do. And now I didn't do it. I should have done it. And now what are they going to think? And so now you could have talked to them. It was unpleasant to talk to them after 24 hours. I just don't want, I don't know how they're going to take what I'm going to say. Then three days goes by. Woo, it's been three days now. Now they're going to think I didn't get back with them. Then now they're going to really think I don't want to talk to them. Then a week goes by. Hell, I just don't... And after, you know, after about 30 days, you just don't call them. That is a cluttered life full of condemnation of things you know you should have done that you never got around to doing. And if you leave that in your life, it will choke your ability to dream. You can't look to the future with all that mess hanging around you. Amen? 
So deal with unfinished business. Hallelujah. Maybe I shouldn't talk about this one too much. But if there's something in your closet that you've been through the whole winter and didn't wear, give it to somebody. And if three fashion cycles have rolled around, don't give it to anybody. Throw it away. Nobody wants to walk around with your 1920s hat on that you thought you might wear again some Easter. No, get rid of it. I said get rid of it. You know, the funny thing is, what is it? What is it? I might use that someday. I got a bunch of stuff in my storage room right now that's going to the dump. You hear me? I'm talking about dump. D-U-N-P, dump. Stuff like, well, that's a good cap. If I ever need to cap off an inch and a quarter pipe, I'll have that thing. What could a cap for an inch and a quarter pipe cost? I guarantee it's worth your time to go buy you one than it is to spend half a day looking for that to save a dollar. I know people that will spend, you know, $5 of gas to drive across town because gas is a penny a gallon cheaper. Now, you've got to get rid of that. You can't be looking to your future living that way. We're talking about building our future here. Now, I'm going to tell you something else. When you hear a message like this, the number one temptation is to look at somebody else. I'm better than them. I may be bad, but I'm not that bad. Listen, let me just tell you something about the mirror. It's 2D. You can look at yourself in the mirror. Let somebody take a picture of you from the side. He don't look like the mirror. I'm okay. No. No, darling, you're not. So let's get a three-dimensional reality. Does that make sense? Of seeing things how they really are instead of justifying things that are and begin to make some changes. And one of the things is don't judge others. And here's why. The moment you judge somebody else, you're sabotaging your own progress. Who cares why they're where they are, why they look like that, why they do that? I, it doesn't matter to me because what they do doesn't have anything to do with my future. What I need to do is unclutter my life. I need to live this way regardless of what anybody else is doing. Amen? Now, the other thing I need to tell you about that is it's going to take you some time. The reason I said discipline is it's not going to happen overnight. And you're all stirred up because, see, the Word produces faith. Faith produces energy, and it gets your wheels to going. Whoa, I'm thinking about my future. Whoa, I'm going to clean up that storage house. Whoa, hallelujah. But I can guarantee you there's three or four unexpected things that you're going to have to deal with that are going to come up this week. So the only way you can do that is sit down with your calendar. I'm learning this the hard way, but I'm learning it the right way. I take my calendar now and put it on my chest, and I walk around going, Oh, you have wisdom. You know how it's supposed to be, Lord. You know where I'm supposed to be, when I'm supposed to be there. You know how I'm supposed to get there. Oh, Lord Jesus. You're the architect of my schedule. You're the architect of my life. You're the architect. You're the builder of my future. See, I have made a decision. When we came into this year, God began to talk to me about some of these things. And one of the things that I made a decision about is no longer am I going to live life as it comes at me. Now, people can continue to do that if they want. That's fine. I'm not. Because I have something to do. And realistically, real facts are I don't have eternity to do them in. I have one body and a limited time. So I'm going to get them done. Third thing. We're talking about freeing yourself to dream. Curb impulsive acts. If God's in something, it'll stay with you for a while. It won't leave you. Quit giving in to that, oh, I just got to have that, and then put it on a credit card. Because what you're going to wind up doing is mortgage your future. Because a couple of seasons from now, let's talk about these seasons. A couple of seasons from now, that coat's not going to be worth what it was when you put it on that credit card. And you're going to be paying for yesterday's groceries. Nobody likes to pay for yesterday's groceries. Amen? Curb impulsive acts. Things like credit cards. So there's other things we do that are impulsive. But listen, live out of your spirit. If we're talking about casting vision for the future, number one, we talked about being free, taking control of your life. Number two, we talked about freeing yourself to dream. Number three, get rid of the deadly sin of looking back. 
right out beside that Hebrews eleven fifteen, as it says that had they been mindful of the country from which they had come, they'd had many opportunities to return. Number four, he talked to me about real strong this phrase, clarifying your motive. Let me just tell you, you will never free up enough of energy inside yourself to dream unless you get free from obligation. If you don't clarify your motive within yourself, what I mean by that? Well, now, here's the scripture I want to use. 2 Corinthians seven eleven. He talks about being sorry after a godly sort, making some changes, repenting. And he says, behold, this self-same thing that you sorrowed after a godly sort, what carefulness it wrought in you. Yea, what clearing of yourselves. Yea, what indignation, what fear, what vehement desire, what zeal, what revenge. In all things you've approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. See, that's what happened to Nehemiah when he was up on that wall and God told him to rebuild the city. Do you remember what happened? The enemy hired counselors to say, I know the naughtiness of your heart. I know why you're really doing this thing. See, if Nehemiah had not clarified his own motive inside himself, then the accusers would have gotten his attention and the work would have stopped. That's the number one thing that Satan's going to come after. And there are two major areas you have to be delivered from. Number one, you, at all costs, you have to be delivered from this aspect. Now listen, we're talking about clarifying your motive. You have to be delivered from obligation to do things. Here's why. If you're doing what you're doing because you feel obligated, I can guarantee you it's attached to your past. You had some kind of an interaction, some kind of a commitment you made, some kind of a relationship that has made you feel like, I need to do this thing because of this. That's not future. That's not dreaming. That's not vision. That's obligation. And unless you can clarify your motive enough inside yourself to be strong enough to say, no, this situation, it's time commitment, it's investment, and everything I'm doing is not conducive to where I'm going now. Now, there's only one way to do that. I said there's two things you need to get free from, but they really interact. They interact with each other. Now, the first one is free from obligation. Well, do you want to know why we feel obligated to do stuff? Because we're afraid of what other people think. So until you can get free from what other people think about you, you'll never be free from obligation. And until you're free from obligation, you'll never be free from your past. And it's a fear that breeds and breeds and breeds and breeds. And there's only one way to get delivered. Spend enough time with God to know what He's told you to do and be so serious about doing it that anything that gets in the way, you just don't even want to do that anyway. Everything I'm talking to you about, I'm human. I've walked through, and I haven't conquered them all yet, but I know this. One thing I have conquered, I have made the decision to conquer the rest. No, I haven't conquered them all. No way. And it's going to take me some, some time, but I'm going to do it. You know why? Because I learned this. You take a piece of paper, and you put a line down the middle, and on the top of this side over here, you write past. And on the top of this side over here, you write future. And then you start thinking about what you want to do. What do you want to do? And the truth is, and you might as well go and do what I did, because every one of you is in the same issue. You might as well underpass the very top of the list. You might as well put debt. Because till you deal with that, number one, you're not going to get much further. So deal with that. Now, on the future side, decide what you want to do. What do you have to have? Let me ask you this. If you need to accumulate certain things to put you in position to do whatever it is the Lord wants you to do, are your current habit patterns and spending habits conducive to producing that? And if they're not, you've got a pipe dream. I mean, I don't want to bust your bubble, but it's no better than the lottery because it's the diligent person that's going to be made fat. It's the faithful man that will abound with blessings. And so consequently, if we keep living the way we're living, thinking that one day, hallelujah, glory to God, my ship is going to come in and then I'll be able to build this. Not going to happen. Because the truth is, if you got a hundredfold off of every seed you sowed, you would have already had enough to do it. You've got enough seed in the ground probably right now. Now, I'm not telling you don't sow. And when you plant your seed, you're going to sow towards your future because that's what your seed should represent. And you know why a lot of people's tithing doesn't benefit them? Because they're tithing out of obligation. 
They're afraid God's going to curse them if they don't. They think their tithe is tied to the curse, which is tied to the past. What their tithe is tied to is their future and open heaven, vision. And the day you make that shift is the day you'll run your tithe to the plate. Why? Because it's my seed from a future. Now listen, money has a mission. And I've heard that a long, long time. But I need to tell you something. Money actually has more than one mission. Money has missions, plural. Part of your money has a mission to advance the kingdom as we know it. But God's system, God lets you keep 90%. If the only thing God had in mind, I mean the only thing he had in mind, was just building a church and doing missions and having orphanages. Guarantee he'd want more than 10%. He evidently has your mission in mind too. See, the idea behind the 10% is to get God connected to your 90% so you can fulfill your mission. And it's okay to spend some of that money on your mission. Religion has made us so dumb that we feel guilty. I mean, after all, Jesus gave it all. You've got to give it all to him. That's not what the book says. The book says give your heart to him and 10% of your income. Part of your income is for you to be able to spread your mission, your essence, who you are into this world system. So you need to realize then it's okay to put some back. It's not a lack of faith to have insurance, and it's not a lack of faith to have a savings account. In fact, the Bible says you can have not a barn, but barns. And he said he'll bless your barns, plural. And a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. He's evidently interested in what you want too. If he gave you a goodly house, it must mean he wants you to have a house. If he, You understand what I'm saying to you? He cares about you. He loves you. Wants you to have the best. Wants you to be blessed. But not at the expense of fulfilling why you're here on the planet. And that has been the problem. We've been taking the 90% doing what we wanted to do, living a cluttered life, buying knickknacks, getting under condemnation, tied to the past, instead of freeing ourselves from that and taking the 90% to dream with. He cares about you. And the number one thing he wants more than anything else is to get you and me free enough to embrace our future. Take that sheet of paper, draw out there on it, my past, my future, draw a line right down the middle and then you just start shutting your eyes what do i need you know most christians don't have their future defined enough to know what they need so that side of the page stays blank and you don't want to know why i bet you could fill up the other side with things you do every day that are things you have to deal with with your past well i got to do this because of that and i got to do this because of that and this because of this the way it is because of that. That's all past. You see what I'm saying? You get over here on this side, and you know what you'll find? You are, and I am, anemic. We haven't spent any of our creative energy building our dream. If we had, it'd be just as easy to fill that side up. Amen? I'm telling you, you need to get alone with God and shut your eyes and start dreaming. Where do I want to go? What do I want to have? What am I going to need? I'm asking you, don't miss this. I'm telling you, your dream is going to come to pass. And there's a way to get there. And you have everything you need to do it. Now, how does this relate to me, to you? Well, we're going to have to make a decision. I hadn't conquered everything on the list, but I've made a decision to step toward it. How many of you believe that when you accepted Jesus of Nazareth, as your Lord and your Savior, how many can testify that maybe you were carrying around a thousand pounds, but you didn't know it? Can you honestly say that the day I accepted Jesus as Lord, the moment I said, Jesus, be my Lord, you felt a release? It's like, it's like somebody let a slip knot go, and a million pounds dropped off your shoulder. See, the problem was you didn't know it a few minutes before that. But when you made that decision, what happened? Well, why? Because it says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Some of you certainly are longtime Christians, but there may be somebody in the sound of my voice that has never made Jesus Christ the Lord of their life. In other words, they can't point to their spiritual birthday. Well, if we all will revisit that place to where we became a new creature, we will realize the day we were born again, the reason we felt the way we did, 
is because when you're brand new, you don't have a past. And the Lord wants to deal with the things that have been haunting you, telling you, I cannot get where I need to go. Amen? I want to be that person to where I know that I know that I know that when my last breath is here, my first breath is seeing Jesus face to face in eternity. If you're here like that today, or maybe, maybe you're so dealing with issues, you know, a man's character is what he does in the dark. Maybe you say, well, I'm a believer and I've been struggling with this. I've been putting the word on it, but I have some issues I've been dealing with. Maybe it's habits. Maybe it's thoughts. Maybe it's things you're watching or seeing that you shouldn't see or watch. I'm telling you right now, by the Spirit of God, you can get newness. You don't have to be tethered to your past. You can recommit, rededicate your life, and you can come to that place of newness. Every one of us as a believer is going to come to that place today as a body. That's what the Lord showed me. He showed me that's the starting line, is that when you know that you know, you made Jesus Christ of Nazareth the Lord of your life. Amen? So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to ask every one of you right now, whether you've been a long-time Christian or never made the decision to make Jesus the Lord of your life, I don't know who all's in the sound of my voice, but I do know that Jesus loves you and he wants to make all things brand new for you. And he doesn't want you to leave here today without making this decision. So we're going to say this out loud, not only to help ourselves, but the person next to us make that decision to know they're not making that decision alone. You don't have to walk down an aisle and shake the hand of a man, but in your heart, you do have to make the decision to cross the line. I want you to shut your eyes, and I want you to say, I'm starting at this place, but when I finish up, this is what you're deciding in your heart. I'm stepping across the line to allow God to make everything new in my life. Let me see your hand. If the message ministered to you that way, and you want things to become brand new in your life, all you got to do is simply say, Pastor, include me in that prayer. I'm going to join that, and I'm going to follow you in that prayer. Is that you? God bless you, everybody. Glory to God. That is awesome. So let's say it this way. We're not alone. Amen? We're not alone in this thing in Jesus' name. We're doing this together. Say this out loud with me. Lord Jesus, I believe you have all power in heaven above and earth beneath. All power in your name means this. You have the power to forgive me, to heal me, to cleanse me, to deliver me. That means... Nothing I've done, no mistake I've made, no sin I've committed is greater than your blood and its power to wash it away. You make all things brand new. And today, I believe you have the power to make me brand new. So I believe. I believe the tomb is empty. I believe you lived a sinless life, that you shed your blood, died a spotless death, and you died for me. I believe you went to hell in my place and defeated sin, the devil, and defeated the power of hell. When you rose again, you came out of that tomb in your body, guaranteeing not just a spiritual victory, but you brought it into the natural realm. And in your body, you ascended into heaven. And right now, you are the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. King of kings, Lord of lords, seated at the right hand of God. I see you as that. I believe you're risen from the dead. I confess you are Lord. So I'm asking now, Lord of creation, Lord of all of life, be the Lord of my life. Now, move into my heart. Make all things new. Cleanse me now. Deliver me now. I know now, because you cannot lie, I have passed from death to life. I belong to you. You live in me. Heaven is my home. I'm a new creature. I'm born again. That means this. Everything in my life is new. Now I want you to let that sink in for a second because you're about to do something else. You're about to take a step. You're about to get free. Because let me tell you, you don't get saved by grace and kept by your works. So even if you've been a Christian and made some mistakes, it doesn't matter 
He's about to untether you from your past. It doesn't matter. It's history. We're not spending more time talking about this thing. Hallelujah. Now I'll say this. As a new creature, As a new creature. I, accept I accept the fact that the all-powerful God, the all-powerful God cannot, lie. cannot lie. He's told the truth about me. Truth about me. With his blood, he washed my sin away. So I stand today before God as if sin never existed. And I make a decision to step across the line and not deal with my past again. That man is dead. He's gone. And by faith, I bury him now. Glory to God. Now, I want you to say one more thing. Lord Jesus, I'm free to dream. 